Hello, hello everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here this very sunny, beautiful afternoon. I am Lalita Duperon. I'm in the Center for South Asia and we are delighted to be one of the sponsors of today's event. The event today, as you can see on the slide, 120 years of women's resistance in Iran and Afghanistan is co-sponsored by the Hoover Institution Library and Archives, the Stanford Center for South Asia, which is represented by me today, and the Stanford Program for Feminist Gender and Sexuality Studies. And we're very grateful to all the co-sponsors of today's event. Uh, today we have a panel discussion, oral, Hoover oral historian Halima Kazem and Hoover fellow Kelly J. Shannon will address the often overlooked histories of women's rights activism and resistance against oppressive regimes in Iran and Afghanistan going back 120 years. The speakers will trace the history of the women's movements in each country and highlight the convergences and similarities between the Afghan and Iranian women's rights movements. This history of women's resistance is not only centrally important to Afghan and Iranian women's struggles today, but also integrates their struggle into a conversation around global gender studies. The panel discussion will include brief presentations by both speakers, followed by a moderated discussion with the panelists and the audience. Here to my left, Dr. Halima Kazem is an oral historian and project manager at Stanford University, currently building an oral history archive on Afghanistan and the U.S.-Afghan war at the Hoover Institution right here. Halima's work is deeply rooted in feminist methodologies and 20 years of working as a journalist and human rights researcher. Halima holds a PhD in feminist studies from UC Santa Cruz and a master's in business and economic journalism from New York University. From 2012 to 2022, she was a journalism and human rights lecturer at San Jose State. Before that, she spent 17 years as a journalist and filmmaker, including a decade reporting on, on Afghanistan's war and rebuilding efforts. In the middle, Dr. Kelly J. Shannon is the 2023-2024 W. Glenn Campbell and Rita Ricardo Campbell National Fellow at the Hoover Institution. She was Associate Professor of History at Florida Atlantic University from 2014 to 2024, where she also served as the Executive Director of the Center for Peace, Justice and Human Rights. Dr. Shannon specializes in the history of U.S. foreign relations with a particular focus on the Islamic world, Iran and women's human rights. She's the author of U.S. Foreign Policy and Muslim Women's Human Rights, published by the Pens uh, University of Pennsylvania Press in 2018, and she's currently working on a book on the foundation of the U.S. relationship with Iran entitled The Ties That Bind U.S.-Iran Relations 1905 to 1953. Our moderator for today is Dr. Rachelle Jean-Baptiste. She is the Michelle Mercer and Bruce Golden Family Professor in Feminist and Gender Studies and the Faculty Director of Stanford's Feminist, Gender and Sexuality Studies Program and also Professor of History and African and American African, African American Studies. She is a historian of 20th and 21st century French speaking Central and West Africa and the Atlantic world. Her most recent book, Multiracial Identities in Colonial French Africa, Race, Childhood and Citizenship, was published by Cambridge University Press in 2023. Thank you so much all for being here. Thank you to the audience. I'll get off the stage and pass it over to Dr. Kazem. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome and welcome to our guests on Zoom. So one note that I will say, um, trying to put 350 pages of writing into a 20 minute presentation is very hard. So I have to be very selective in what I share with you. So there are gaps in the presentation just because of lack of time, but there is a lot more I could teach a semester's worth, um, you know, with, with what I've researched and what I've written. But let's let's uh, get to a very important point in, um, in Afghanistan's uh, history, and that is August 2021, the fall of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, which is um, deeply an, an American project, a global project. It was the period of the Republic. So right at the fall on August 15, 2021, and for us Afghans, that's a very, very emotional uh, 
very difficult day. Um, these are some of the headlines in the New York Times. Desperate Afghan women wait for US protection as promised. August 18th, 2021, Kamala Harris pledges US help for Afghan women and children. August 26, 2021, at pro-Taliban rally, a sign of America's failure, droves of veiled faces, September 12th, 2021. So what do some of these have in common, these headlines? America, yes, centering America. But what it also has is, that, is um, a sense of Afghan women as victims, even though it's 20 years after the Republic project started. And I call it a project because I do think that it has these imperial forces that run through, um, run through this 20 year period. A lot of good happened, but a lot, of, a lot went wrong as well. And I study that here at Hoover. So thinking about protection, some of the words, thinking about pledges US help, thinking about America's failures in veiled faces. So the tropes that have existed about Afghan women all of these decades. So those made me think. So these headlines reiterate, reiterate the tropes about Afghan women circulating in the West as helpless victims. But reading the history through a feminist lens makes visible a deep history of women's influence in politics and resistance to patriarchy, interpretations of religion and politics. It's a history that predates the feminist movements in the US and at times on par with women's history in European and Asian empires. And I'll explain that. Why does this matter? This history places Afghan women's movements in their regional context and within the framework of global feminist and gender studies. The thing with Afghanistan is with all the falls of the empire and the, and the new empires and progress and regression, we lose the history and people start around the world start to think that the current moment has always been the history. And so that's why it's very important to uncover this history, center it and, and share it. Afghanistan is the only country that engaged all three major empires of the 20th and 21st centuries. Afghan women shaped the politics of their time and interacted with Afghan regimes in foreign empires. The British, Soviet, and American empires define themselves in Afghanistan through the rhetoric of liberation and modernization. We can see that as far back as the British in the early 1800s, and we can actually see it during time, the time of the Republic where the US was um, center and central in the building of the Republic. Each imperial formation enacted its own gendered projects, which created the conditions in which Afghanistan's leaders and women operated. So Afghan male rulers were influenced by these imperial formations that were affecting Afghanistan. And in turn, it affected gender policies in the lives of Afghan women. So before, um, before I go into some of the more modern day, and I know we've said it's 120 years, but I'd like to go back a little bit further because some of this is lost. And in my, in my research, in my doctoral research, I uncovered so much of this that excited me. And these are prominent Afghan women in history. And I use these drawings because obviously nothing exists as far as photographs. Um, and it's very hard to piece together histories. Um, and so you use, you use methods like myths and folk tales and songs in poetry and oral histories to try to piece together the histories of these women. But I'd just like to read out some of the, the women's names. Rabia Balhi, which was a 10th century poet, Possible saint, um, I say possible saint because there's evidence that it's very likely that she was a saint, but she, was, um, she, was, she wasn't given that title because of a fear of she would develop a following. She has, um, she has a, a place, her place of burial is in uh, Northern Afghanistan and I visited that place and a lot of women go as pilgrimage and they, um, uh, respects to her. And then there's Zaruna Anna, who's 18th century. She's depicted here a little bit older. She's the poet, mother, and advisor to, to King Ahmad Shah Durrani, who is the founder of modern day Afghanistan. And so he's credited as the father of Afghanistan, but what we don't really read about and understand is how his mother affected him in a lot of ways. And so see, these are some of the women in earlier periods. And then 
I think that the Malalai of Maiwand from 19th century, she's a war heroine. I think she's very important here because she might not be real. She might be an amalgamation or um, of many other women of that period, but she's very central because in the second Anglo-Afghan war in 1880, the, the Afghans were losing in Maiwand, in the village of Maiwand in south eastern, uh, southwestern Afghanistan. And this woman appears on the battlefield and raises what some will say a red scarf or a red flag and, and captures the attentions of the Afghan soldiers and calls them, rallies them and calls them um, to fight for their homeland. And the Afghans end up winning in the British retreat, losing a thousand soldiers. So this, this um, image here is actually a modern image of uh, a Malalai of Maiwand. And in the back are US trained Afghan troops. This was from an image created in 2021 and posted by the Minister of Women's Affairs in Afghanistan as the battle between the Taliban, the US and the Afghan forces was in, 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 in heat. I mean, in such a, a difficult place. And they brought the image of Malalai up to uh, rally the troops. Um, and she's wearing this bright orange um, outfit with her scarf on and carrying the current Afghan flag. Um, and her image is still strong and the myth of Malalai still holds. Malalai Yousafzai, the Nobel Prize winner, is named after Malalai of Maiwand, even though she's from uh, Pakistan, but she is Pashtun. So these are some women in Afghan history that have stayed with women all over these years. And as I traveled through Afghanistan, their names came up over and over again in different versions of their stories. And then another area that it's, it's important to point out in the early history of Afghanistan, individual women, mostly queens, had access to power. And so we, I study them in their lives because it gives us an idea of how they resisted imperial forces, how they resisted patriarchy within the areas of power that they had. Bibi Halima was the lead wife of Abdurrahman Khan, um, who was in power from 1880 to 1901. Um, she, will, she had a lot of power over her husband who was known as the Iron Emir in Afghanistan and had, was brutal towards many communities. But she had incredible power. She's up here. And that's actual photograph of her. Um, and Ulya Azrat was the lead wife of Habibullah Khan, who was the son of Abdurrahman Khan, and the mother of Amanullah Khan, who was the husband of Queen Saraya. So these three women, these were three powerful queens who fought in their own ways. The top two fought in very individual and personal ways for their own consolidation of power and to be put in positions of power. Um, the, the top two, Bibi Halima and Ulya Azrat, lived as part of harems. But, so we generally have this idea in the West of harems as a place where women don't have agency. But these women had quite a bit of agency into understanding harems from the Avon perspective. I do that a lot in, in, um, in my work. Um, but they were trained horse riders, warriors. Um, Bibi Halima would actually uh, push, uh, launch the troops off if there was a rebellion in the empire um, and her husband was away, so she would lead the troops. But a lot of this history is in the margins. It's not written in the political history of Afghanistan. Queen Saraya, which is probably the queen that most people are familiar with and, and know, um, she was the queen in the early 1900s. She was the uh, wife of Amanullah Khan. She was only one wife. The Amanullah Khan did not have a harem, uh, which was very different. And she was the, she had the first official office of the queen, the official seal of the Shahzada Khanum. Um, and she opened girls' schools, ran a women's magazine, revolutionary at the time. She went on a European tour with the king and astonished the world as the image of an Afghan woman. She, I consider her as the first feminist period. So the women before her were individuals, but with um, Queen Saraya, she, she marks the beginning of the first feminist period in Afghanistan. And the Amani reforms, Amani coming from the name Amanullah, the Amani reforms 
to modernize um, were very strong. Um, she wrote publicly against opinions in edicts of the clergy, citing the Quran and Islamic teachings. She went on tour on a European tour with the king and astonished the world as the image of an Afghan woman. Here she is in one of the photos. I think it's in England, I think she was at. And um, she's not covered. She's not wearing a face. She's wearing a European hat. This is 1928. So for the queen of Afghanistan to be traveling looking like that, that was incredible and revolutionary at the time. Um, she went to Persia, modern day Iran, where the women wore the large chaudars. Um, they covered much of their faces. Soraya wore the European hats with a thin veil attached to the brim. Um, this, was, um, this was very controversial and the clergy sent Amanla a letter asking that as long as they were in the country, that Soraya would fully cover her face. They, um, the queen um, in Persia actually did not reveal her face from, um, fully until 1937. So, so um, Soraya was uh, ahead of her time there. So first period, um, 1920, led by King, King Amanullah and Queen Soraya. And here she is, this is the illustrated London news from 1928. Um, showing the Afghan queen as seen in Europe. And they were just fascinated with her because this, she had shattered the image of the Afghan queens. So I'm gonna jump forward quite a bit. And like I said earlier, there are other periods in between the periods that I'm presenting here too, um, but for the sake of time. So a second period I will call out 1960s to 1970s. Um, leaders such as Dr. Anahita Ratib Saad and other women who were part of the Afghan communist regime. Um, developments, this, there's Sura Suraya Parli Khan, another Afghan woman activist at one of the first international conferences that these women attended, which was very um, incredible for them in the late 60s uh, because it opened them up to, if we can call them at the time, we can feminisms of the world feminists of the world, thinking about what Afghan feminism would look like back at home. So they become exposed to, during this period to global feminisms, trying to negotiate that with what they're seeing and understanding in their country. So a second period, 1960s and 70s, definitely two movements in between. Um, and then we have the third period in the late um, 1970s and early 1980s, and this is, after the coup, the communist coup uh, happens in 1978, in spring of 1978 in Afghanistan. And there's a group of women who support the changes, obviously the certain class, um, not as privileged, think that the coup, label the coup as a revolution and wanna be part of it, very value, valid um, concerns. And then there's a group that resists the communist regime because of their brutality and eventually they become more brutal. Then you have groups, radical women's groups, such as Revolu Revolutionary Association of the Women of Afghanistan, or RAWA, and other groups, such as um, uh, Tajwar Kakar, who is not part of RAWA, but part of the resistance in a different way. The different groups with different ideologies resisting the communist, communism in Afghanistan and the disruption to the society that it caused. This would be a third period of feminism in Afghanistan. And this is Mina, who is the founder of Rawa. She is one of the most incredible women I have ever met in Afghanistan. Uh, she's still alive, she's amazing. And then I'll just move forward into the fourth period, which in between there were two other periods because we had a civil war and then we had the first regime of the Taliban. But just to jump forward to saving time, we've got a, fo a fourth period. You have the post 9-11 period and during the American led time of the Republic in Afghanistan, the, between 2001 and 2021 was the largest gender development project in history anywhere in the world. And that was in Afghanistan. The amount of money and resources that were spent to under the guises of saving Afghan women from Afghan men, that was the, the way that it was, it was framed. It was the largest gender project. And I think those of us who study gender, um, who especially in conflict areas are still processing 
just the sheer size of this project, the, the various ways um, it immobilized women, um, and just trying to process all of that. Um, these are but Dr. Masuda Jalal, who was the first woman who to run for president in Afghanistan, um, an uh, amazing woman became became the Minister of Women's Affairs. Dr. Habiba Sarabi, who was the, one of the first governors, um, uh, female governors of a major province, and then also on the Peace Council. Um, two prominent women whose careers emerged um, really hit their peak during the time of the Republic from 2001 to 2021. And I think, well, their careers, they were, they are, they were older um, when the Republic started, but their careers peaked during that time. And then you've got present day, present day Afghanistan, which has seen a lot of regression. And there's a campaign to look at the conditions in Iran and Afghanistan um, for women as gender apartheid, looking at the um, definition of racial apartheid and applying that in a way uh, for gender apartheid. So on August 15th, 2021, everything changed for women in Afghanistan. Since then, there have been 70 edicts, more than that, I think it's like 84 now. Um, orders and restrictions, the Taliban have systematically imposed a set of policies of inequality that impact every part of a woman's life. The things that changed from the time of the Republic, ban on girls' education after grade six, ban on women working outside of the home, enforcement of strict dress code, ban on being out in public without a manham, ban on women attending universities, closing all women's baths, lawns, and a lot of other restrictions. So this is not the first time women's rights have regressed. One of the reasons the history is not so understood is because there, the last 120 years, there are periods of progress and then regression. Whereas maybe in some of, so I don't know if we can say that now after Roe v. Wade, uh, you know, but generally in other countries, they trend towards, you know, moving towards progress and not a lot of regression. Um, but in Afghanistan, they, they're, there are extreme periods of progress and then extreme periods of regression. And that's important to remember. And what keeps me hopeful is I think this is temporary. I think that the women will continue to move forward. And as I say that, we go into a fifth period. That is the current period. Um, after August 15th, 2021, I categorized this or the part of my periodization project of Afghan, Afghanistan gender um, history is that on August 15th, 2021, with the fall of the US backed Afghan government and the takeover of the country, fifth feminist period started in Afghanistan. And shortly after August, the, the chant that was um, said to, in a lot of the protests, this is one of the protests on Kabul streets, women protested everywhere, knowing how harsh the Taliban are, knowing this. Um, and, their, and what they were chanting was bread, work, freedom. Non kar azadi, bread, work, freedom. And this predates the women life freedom but is related and we'll talk a little bit about how they overlap with the women in Iran and how we're at different points of um, the, the state of the politics are different points for the women in Iran and Afghanistan, but they're related, they're connected. There's a lot of synergy there. The so breadwork freedom became the call, became and becomes a, a very um, basic call for very basic things. That women were starting to uh, were, were starting to really feel that they were entitled to under the but stripped of during the time of the um, so I will leave you uh, with those examples those periods and that's a lot of the work that I do is look at periodization and how we can instead of periodizing or creating periods based on political changes could we look at how uh, women's resistance kind of flows from one but to another on its own. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, thank you to our co-sponsors, the Center for South Asia and um, Feminist Gender and Sexuality Studies, as well as the Hoover Library and Archives. And I have to say a special thank you to the Library and Archives because I've spent the majority of my time here this year in the reading room right across the way.
uh, looking at their wonderful Iranian and Iran-related materials. Um, it's really just a, a wealth of information. Um, and thank you to Samira Bozorki and to Jean Cannon who, and the staff at the library who did the heavy lifting to get us in the room today. Um, so when the protest movement began in Iran in uh, September of 2022, I was at lunch, oh, thank you. Um, I was at lunch with a friend who's in the intelligence community and he was remarking how surprised he was to see women at the forefront of these protests in the, the fall of 2022. And I said to him, well, actually, I've long thought that if there's any serious revolution that will overthrow the Islamic Republic in Iran, it will be led by Iran's women. Uh, and he was surprised. And I said, well, if you know Iranian women's history, you won't be surprised. Um, so I'm going to walk you through that history today so that you will also not be surprised to see what women in Iran are doing now. Zan Zendegi Azadi. Woman, life, freedom is the rallying cry of the movement that has broken out against the regime in Iran since September of 2022. Um, it began because of the death at, at the hands of the so-called morality police of a young woman named Masa Jina Amini, who's pictured here. Um, supposedly, she wasn't wearing her mandatory hijab or headscarf properly. Uh, and so the state sanctioned murder was the spark for the movement, but the movement has been about so much more. Uh, protesters have called for social justice, democracy, human rights, and especially women's rights. And women have been at the forefront of these protests um, alongside male allies who also oppose the harsh oppression of women that has occurred in Iran since the founding of its current government in 1979. Now, just to situate us uh, geographically, you know, historians love maps. Um, we're, we're here in the Middle East. Um, these protests occurred throughout the country. It was a national unity um, around these issues of, of women's rights and, and the repression of all Iranians by the current regime. And of course, you can see that it is neighbors with Afghanistan, and there's a lot of shared uh, history there. Um, now, the massive protests that began, um, you can see some photos here, including some schoolgirls in the bottom center flipping off a photo of the supreme leaders. Uh, <laughs> uh, these mass protests have largely died down since the spring of 2023, but it doesn't mean that the movement is over. Uh, Iranians continue to resist the regime in multiple and often very creative ways, including women refusing to wear the headscarf in public, despite the passage recently of new laws that impose harsher penalty on women who refuse to bail. So this movement builds on well over a century of Iranian women's rights activism at home and internationally. Uh, Iranian women today are descendants of generations of women who have fought hard to claim their rights. Um, so I'm gonna briefly lay out this history for you to, to, to situate the current movement in its historical context, but of course I cannot do justice to this history in 20 minutes. Um, so like uh, Halima, I've thought about periodization, but it's a little messier than the Afghan version. Uh, Iranian women's activism has often ebbed and flowed in concert with changes in Iran's political situation. And you can see from the slide here, there were many. Uh, Iran's political uh, history in the 20th century is very complicated. Um, so I'm gonna give you a simplified narrative of this, uh, but just, I wanna say that you might've heard of waves of feminism often discussed um, regarding women's history, but that's very US and Western European centric. Um, you know, The first wave of the US is the 19th century to the passage of women's rights to vote in 1920. Um, and so on and so forth. But um, there's long been a history in Iran as well, but the, the ebbs and flows, but the crests of the wave and the recession of the wave have happened at different times than in the West. So while there were individual women who called for women's rights in the 19th century, most historians agree that the movement for women's rights began during the Iranian constitutional revolution of 1905 to 1911. Um, that revolution was the Islamic world's first mass pro-democracy movement, and Iranians at the time mobilized against the inefficient and corrupt ruling Qajar dynasty, which had allowed foreign powers, especially Russia and Great Britain, significant power to interfere in Iran's affairs. The constitutionalists called for social justice, an end to foreign domination, and a representative democratic government. They were successful in getting their Shah, the monarch, to adopt a new constitution in early 1907 that fundamentally transformed the country from an absolute monarchy into a constitutional monarchy 
where there was a relatively weak Shah who shared governing power with an elected parliament called the Majlis. Now, during the revolution, for the first time in Iran's history, Iran's women took to the streets in political protest. Um, so there have been other kinds of protests, but this one was fundamentally political. They engaged in a wide array of activities to support the constitutionalist movement and especially to if oppose foreign domination. These women marched, they raised money, they demonstrated, they formed secret societies, wrote letters to newspapers, founded the country's first women's periodicals, organized boycotts, carried pistols, and even sometimes engaged in violence or threatened violence, which I'd be happy to talk about in the, the Q&A. Uh, as commenters at the time noted, women's support was critical to the advances that the constitutionalists made. Now, as often has been the case when women are part uh, participating in social and political movements worldwide, in fighting for the rights of their country, Iranian women came to realize they needed to fight for their own rights because they lacked rights in their society. Iranian women at the time were second-class citizens in most areas of life, and even teaching a woman to read in certain circles was socially taboo. Now, women's constitutionalist activism in and of itself could be seen as a claim for women to be seen as political actors. Um, that This was an unprecedented foray into the political realm. They were staking their claim to being you know, Iranian citizens. Um, but there were some courageous Iranian women constitutionalists, um, mostly literate women, who went further and began to articulate a feminist argument for their own rights as women, especially because the new constitution in 1907 did not grant women equal rights and explicitly denied them the right to vote. Uh, and in this period coming out of the revolution, education was one of the, the primary issues that women um, tried to draw attention to. Now, this movement um, that began during the revolution continued well after the revolution ended in 1911 with an invasion by Russia to crush the constitutionalists. Um, and so this largely operated through women's periodicals and underground societies until feminism in Iran began to mature in the 1920s. Uh, and so the period after the end of World War I, um, which I will say was very devastating for Iran, um, opened up the political possibilities for all Iranians and Iranian women seized this opportunity to continue to push against uh, very significant conservative forces and call for their own rights. Uh, and so women start to create a space for themselves. And the international context of increased women's rights activism worldwide was also important to this movement. Um, Iranian women watched with interest what, what, what women elsewhere were doing, uh, it gave them inspiration, it gave them confidence, and they were in conversation with women's movements in other countries. Uh, they were especially interested, uh, and if you look at feminist periodicals from the time, um, you'll see that they're really especially interested in the successful movement for the right to vote in the United States and Great Britain, and they're especially interested in feminist movements in Turkey and Egypt at the time, which were leading the way in the Islamic world. Uh, so during this period, the late 1910s and early 1920s, Iranian women advocated for women's education, voting rights, economic independence and employment, health care, the right not to veil, and other things. And they condemned practices they saw as harmful, such as child marriage. Now they did this in women's periodicals that they founded in this period. Um, some, many significant women's journals, magazines, uh, newspapers were founded in the early 20s. And they also continued to found feminist organizations and societies, um, most notably the Association of Patriotic Women, which was founded in 1922. Uh, so this group organized women at the grassroots level, held classes, published periodicals, led protests and demonstrations, and called loudly for equality. Now, progress was slow and the opposition was fierce, um, sometimes even violent, but the feminist movement in this period forced the government to start paying attention to women's needs. Uh, and a sign of this was the government opening the first public schools for girls in this period. Of course, everything changes because of the political situation. Uh, when Reza Khan, a military officer who founded the Pahlavi dynasty took the throne in 1925. Uh, he began to centralize power in uh, his own hands and in the central government in Tehran and also was a secularizing modernizer. 
So he both silenced independent organizations in the country and co-opted the issue of women's equality into his modernizing agenda. Uh, so independent feminist organizations in Iran ceased to operate by 1932 uh, and were brought under the umbrella of the Pahlavi state. Um, and at the same time, you see things like the Shah's government banning women from wearing the veil in 1936. Uh, now, this was a custom that Iranian feminists have been criticizing since the 1910s, but banning the veil was a problem because it took away women's choice and the way it was implemented was problematic. Uh, and so we see this as a period when um, independent feminist activism really goes into recession because of Reza Pahlavi. Of course, everything changes again with the Second World War. Um, sorry. Go. Um, in 1941, Great Britain and Soviet Union invaded and occupied Iran because Reza Pahlavi was increasingly pro-German and Iran was strategically critical to the Allied war effort. Um, they occupied the country and eventually alongside American troops, uh, deposed Reza Pahlavi and his 22-year-old son, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi took the throne. Uh, this offered another moment of political openness for Iranians that Iranian feminists exploited. Uh, so again, the country reverts to the 1907 version of government. Um, so initially Reza Shah, or sorry, Mohammad Reza Shah rules as a constitutional monarch alongside an elected parliament. Uh, he was relatively weak. And in this period, all sorts of new political parties are formed and new social organizations are created including many new feminist organizations. Uh, and so these organizations pushed for women's equality on many fronts uh, until they, they joined forces in 1952 uh, and multiple women's organizations submitted a petition with 100,000 signatures calling for women's political and economic rights that they submitted to the parliament. Now, of course, the government did not grant those rights. And if you know Iran's history, uh, in 1953, the prime minister, Mohammad Mossadegh, was overthrown in a coup that was supported by the US and the British. Um, I'm not going to get into the coup, but that, that it brings to an end this moment of political possibility for independent feminist activism. Uh, we now have, after 1953, a situation where Mohammad Reza Pahlavi used the coup as a way to consolidate more power in his own hands. Uh, he started to emulate his father, father in that respect. And so we yet again have a period when independent feminist organizations are brought under the control of the state and feminist uh, goals, women's equality, are again co-opted by the Pahlavi state. But the difference in this time period is that women's rights activists very cleverly work from within the system to get a lot of the changes that they wanted. Um, you know, under Reza Shah, women were not in any sort of position of power, but we do see women starting to hold very influential positions under his son. Uh, and so we see real progress in the period between 1953 and 1979. Now, the Shah infamously was not a feminist. He gave this uh, interview in 1978 to an Italian journalist, Oriana Falacci, where he made some very sexist comments about women's inferiority. But women's equality and their progress were markers of his success towards modernization, and it played well with international audiences. Uh, and this is something that um, Iranian women, women's rights activists were able to seize upon and um, started to be able to influence the government under the Shah to pass laws that benefited women. Um, so some of this, this push came from within the royal family itself, um, and the, the two most influential women here are uh, Princess Ashraf, the twin sister of the Shah, who was a force to be reckoned with. Uh, she spearheaded, spearheaded a lot of the women's rights activism within the government, and then Empress Farah, the Shah's third wife, um, who was twice divorced before he married her, um, but these women really symbolized for the world uh, what Iranian advancement looked like. And they allowed for um, other women working within the government to push for women's progress in literacy and education, healthcare, social status, political rights, and legal rights. Uh, and this became one important pillar of the Shah's modernizing program called the White Revolution, which was started in 1963. 
an earlier state entity that had centralized the activities of women's organizations in Iran uh, rebranded itself in 1966 as the Women's Organization of Iran. And this actually is a very important uh, organization for this period. Um, it was a state organized entity, but it also had a lot of autonomy and influence flowed both ways. Um, the WOI did not simply take what the, the Shah's government said and implement it. Uh, instead, they were on the ground. They organized women um, at the local level. They had uh, literacy programs, vocational training. They trained women in how to participate politically. Uh, and they established family welfare centers and worked internationally with women from other countries. Uh, and so I'm not gonna get too much into the international uh, elements here, but I will say Iranian women have been very prominent in the global movement for women's rights from the 1960s forward. Uh, and so, especially under the leadership of Mana Zafkhami, who was a US trained academic um, who took over as the WOI secretary general in 1970, um, you see her really trying to use WOI as a tool to influence the people at the top. Uh, and so she would send out her volunteers across Iran into rural areas and they would meet women and they would say, what would you think about a law that would give you right to, the right to divorce? And they would say, well, that's great, but we need food on the table. And how are we supposed to support ourselves if we don't have anybody to watch our kids right, while we're at work? So WOI then founds daycare centers, and then they go back to the Shah's government and they say, you need to do more to support women's ability to support themselves economically, as well as legal reforms. And so um, here we see the WOI actually becoming very influential um, it, by the 1970s. And um, these women not only were able to work within the government, but they also used their connections internationally, uh, especially at the UN, to kind of leverage further changes at home. Now, because of all of this activity, uh, Iran before the 1979 revolution um, was at the forefront of the fight for women's equality. Um, under the Shah's regime, the uh, women of Iran had increased access to education, including higher education, um, the right to have a career, equal pay laws, healthcare and reproductive rights, the freedom of dress and movement, and the right to hold vote and hold office, um, such as it was under the Shah's government. Uh, the Shah also passed the Islamic world's most progressive family law at the time, which granted women more rights in marriage, divorce, uh, inheritance, and child custody, and women were starting to get elected to the parliament. Uh, we also see women reaching the highest pinnacles of government under the Shah. Um, the first woman cabinet minister was Farukhru Parsa, uh, minister of education. And I just want to point out that her mother was a member of the Association of Patriotic Women in the 1920s. Uh, and then, of course, Mana Zafkhami ascends to become the Minister of State for Women's Affairs. And that was, at the time, only the second ever cabinet level position in the world dedicated to women's issues. Uh, and so this shows just how much um, Iran was pushing the envelope and a lot of its laws were more progressive than were found anywhere, um, even in the West. Now, of course, not all women benefited equally or at all from a lot of these changes, um, but this, this shows just how much progress women were able to make by working within the system. And yet everything changes again. And I think this is sort of the Taliban moment for Iran. Um, it, Iranian women don't get rolled back quite as far as Afghan women do, but it's really dramatic what happens in 1979. Uh, and so women, for various reasons, um, a lot of women did participate in the revolution against the Shah. Um, some began putting back on the chador, which is the traditional form of veil that you can see in the pictures here. Um, but it's important to note that it was a political symbol. Um, it symbolized a, a resistance against the Shah. It didn't necessarily mean that these women would have supported compulsory veiling or that they intended to continue to wear this after the revolution. Um, and there were a lot of different Iranians with many different visions for what their country should be who joined together uh, in the revolution to overthrow the Shah. Unfortunately, it was um, the Islamic fundamentalists led by Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini, who gets pictured here on the left, uh, who were able to seize control and turn Iran into the modern world's first theocracy. 
Uh, so despite the fact that women had participated in the revolution, one of the first things that Ayatollah Khomeini wanted to do when he seized power in 1979 was roll back women's rights. Uh, in March of 1979, he declared all women must wear the, the headscarf. Um, in response, the tens of thousands of women took to the streets in protest across Iran for days, uh, you know, in, in cities across the country until Khomeini was forced to rescind the de declaration. And yet in 1980, he tried again after he'd fully consolidated political control. Uh, and so here he fired all female judges and once again declared compulsory veiling. Once again, women took to the streets, but they were alone, they were beaten up and forced into compliance. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's notable the difference in the number of men supporting women's rights now versus in 1979 and 1980. So um, to, to kind of sum up since 1979, um, especially since a series of laws passed in the 19, early 1980s, um, women in Iran have you know, faced mandatory hijab, uh, the government's enforced sex segregation and public life, um, banned women from many uh, professions, and dismantled the Shah's progressive family laws. Uh, and this is included reinstating child marriage and polygamy, which were two things that the Shah's government had tried to eradicate. Iranian women haven't taken this lying down. Um, so like Afghan women, they're not victims. Uh, so one consequence of the revolution is that there have been multiple waves of educated politically impassioned Iranian women who've become activists in exile. Um, they left Iran, but they've continued to push for human rights and women's rights in their home country, as well as around the world. Um, these are just two very well-known ones. Um, Dr. Shireen Abadi, who's a Nobel Prize laureate. Um, Azar Nafisi, who's written about her time and her experiences after um, the 79 revolution. Uh, and Manas Afghami was also exiled to the United States and remains a major player in international feminist circles. Uh, and so this is one way that Iranian women have fought back um, and women inside the country have fought back as well. Uh, so especially starting in the 1990s, you start to see mass resistance against mandatory veiling. Um, it's not the only issue for Iranian women. Uh, it symbolizes the broader oppression that they face in the country. But ma mandatory hijab is, is in of itself a problem, uh, especially when you know, a teenage girl can get beaten to death by the police because they don't like how she's wearing her scarf. Uh, and so we see in the 90s what's called the pink revolution. Um, so collectively, especially in urban areas, women start pushing back by showing as much hair as humanly possible under their scarves, wearing more form-fitting outfits and visible makeup. Uh, with the idea that the government can't possibly arrest all of us if we all do it. Uh, and so that was a, one way of resisting. Uh, we also see women pushing for more equitable divorce laws, more representation in parliament. Um, they start to seize educational opportunities. So women are now the majority of university students in Iran. Uh, and then we start to see more organized resistance in the 2000s. Um, so in 2006, um, an organization uh, led protests to call for the repeal of laws that discriminated against women. Um, this then evolved into the One Million Signatures campaign, um, led by women like Parveen Ardalan, pictured here, and Nushin Amadi. Um, they organized women at the grassroots level. And their work actually became foundational to the grassroots organizing that allowed for the 2009 Green Movement to happen. Um, this was protests against the supposedly rigged re-election of the hardline president Mahmoud Ahmadinejad in 2009. Um, but there were a lot of other demands articulated by the protesters. And these people were, were organized to get out into the street, in large part building on the networks that the One Million Signatures campaign had built. This movement um, moves online, of course, uh, by the time we get to the 2010s. And so the internet provided new tools. Uh, and once again, we see a real focus on mandatory hijab. Uh, so in 2014, Masa Alinejad, pictured here with the flower in her hair, top, top right, um, she started a thing called My Stealthy Freedom, where she encouraged young women to take off their headscarves in public and post photos of themselves online. Uh, and so the two bottom photographs here come from that site. Um, later in 2017, uh, young women started wearing white headscarves on Wednesdays to protest compulsory veiling. And then a young woman named Vita Movahed um, climbed up onto a utility box on Revolution Street in Tehran uh, 
took off her headscarf, waved it on a stick, which is pictured here on the left. Uh, and this inspired other young women to do the same afterwards. And so they became known as the women of Revolution Street. Now the government has cracked down brutally on all of this, uh, especially since the election to the presidency of Ibrahim Raisi in 2021. Uh, and of course we know he just died yesterday in a helicopter crash. Uh, and so women have faced significant repression. Uh, they remain defiant in the face of this repression. And the movement that they've started since 2022 has evolved away from earlier movements that have called for reform of the Islamic Republic. And instead now they are calling for the overthrow of the regime itself. Uh, and so if they succeed, this might become the first, the world's first feminist led revolution. Uh, women alongside men are calling for women's rights. They're calling for human rights, secular democracy. Um, I think it's gonna be a long process. And I think what we're witnessing right now is the struggle for the soul of Iran, a struggle between autocracy and freedom, between patriarchal oppression and feminist liberation. And of course, I hope freedom wins. Ben Zendiki, Azadi, thank you. Two minutes. I know undoubtedly there are many questions in the audience and on Zoom. I'll just do very brief um, comments. So thank you for these really rich presentations that really resonate with some of the work that I've done in West and West Central Africa, and most recently Haiti, that really provide these complex, as opposed to flattened histories, what we may call the global South. So from your, both of your presentations, I've gotten three kind of, three takeaways. The first is that women's histories are not a side story or side histories, rather they are central to how societies, states, nations have conceived of daily life, personhood, peoplehood, and also governance. So that to a certain extent, women's histories are histories and also human rights. The second takeaway is this idea that this concept called women's rights is also not uniform. You've told a history rather of varied tactics, demands, and also conceptions of what is rights. So again, a very complex um, history here. The other thing that's really fascinating is how radical women's groups, to use your terms, Halima, have been really at the vanguard of defining, or I should say resisting, varied instantiations of oppressive governments. So again, this idea that women's rights are not side stories, but really central to how societies can define freedom. So in terms of thinking about current comments, um, current currents, I should say, so Kelly, within the past 48 hours, how do you think um, the death of the president and foreign minister are going to inform both the women life freedom movement and also state response to it? And then Halima, you talked about how in 2021, there's very much a sense that bread work freedom is not over in spite of the Taliban's repression. So I'm wondering if you can catch up to speed of what resistance looks like today. And then we'll open it up to the audience and alternate between the audience and Zoom. Okay, um, just to be very quickly, uh, I don't think that the death of Raisi is going to change things much in the short term, uh, especially regarding the presidency. Uh, so the, the first vice president, the main vice president, Mohammed Mokhbar, will be the interim president until there are new elections held within the next couple of months. Uh, those are likely going to be very low turnout elections because uh, if at the parliamentary elections in Iran that happened earlier this year had very low turnout because they're not democratic. And the leader, Ali Khamenei, um, he has created a situation where only the most hardline candidates who align with his vision are even allowed to run for things. Uh, now, Arash Azizi, is a, he's a great historian and journalist, wrote a piece uh, yesterday about how he thinks the Speaker of Parliament, Mohammed Khalibaf, will become the new president after the elections. Uh, but we're likely to see another hardliner as president. Where yesterday's helicopter crash uh, really does have an impact is it has to do with this, the succession of the Supreme Leader. Uh, so Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, the current Supreme Leader, is in his 80s. He's in poor health. Um, there's been a lot of speculation about who will succeed him, and Ibrahim Raisi was said to be the front runner, uh, the you know likely pick for next uh, supreme leader. Uh, and Raisi was probably one of the, the people in the regime with the most blood on his hands, um, among a group of people who have a lot of blood on their hands. Um, with his death, that opens up a big question mark. 
who will be the next Supreme Leader. Um, Ali Khamenei's son, Mojtaba, wants to be the next Supreme Leader, but um, his father has said publicly he doesn't want to start a dynasty. Uh, and so who will be the next candidate then? Uh, and so I think this moment when Khamenei finally passes away and there's this struggle for power among the, the next person who wants to be Supreme Leader, um, this could offer an opportunity for the anti-regime movement to exploit. Um, if there's not unity around a central figure, uh, if there's an element of chaos, this could be very useful for people who want to see a different kind of Iran. And as far as the resistance in Afghanistan, it's it's very dangerous. The street protests are, um, there are fewer of them. Um, they're very dangerous because of the surveillance state that the Taliban have created. And they will go after and arrest not just the women themselves, but um, the brothers, the fathers, to remove the breadwinner from the family, which puts a lot more pressure um, on the family. But they've also detained Dozens, and I think we think because there's no accountability, amnesty can't go into the, the prisons. Um, there are probably dozens, even maybe hundreds of women still detained, being tortured um, in the Taliban prisons. So it becomes very hard to resist in the ways that the West recognizes resistance. So resistance, what does it look like at this point? They look like reading groups, where women get together to read on their own, to educate themselves, Maybe it's soft resistance in that way. It's to continue pushing back against the education bans because now we're coming up on almost three years that girls after the sixth grade can't go to school. So how quickly will you drop off on, on um, women, female doctors, nurses, any, any kind of um, profession that's needed in the future? So the resistance looks like education, online education. I'm part of a board um, a, an alliance that um, works on online education programs, works to get school girls at university level of a lot of potential out of the country to study, have online degrees. Those are what the world is working on. It, it, it gives the Taliban a way out because it says, oh, educating girls is not our responsibility anymore, but the world has taken um, that as a responsibility. Um, it also looks like online protests. Social media is still active. The Taliban have not been able to clamp down as much on social media as they wanted to. Um, obviously anonymous. There are a lot of um, uh, women's news organizations popping up that women are reporting anonymously um, under or under pseudonyms. That's what resistance looks like. And also what's, what's concerning is the madras, madrasification of the educational sector, meaning the Taliban are trying to convince the world that madrasas, which are the Islamic schools, and put Islamic in quotations, are the answer to not letting girls go to school, which the world should not, um, the UN and other mechanisms should not agree to that because madrasa education is not enough and it's not uh, uh, under Islamic terms. That's not just what the girls are allowed. So. It's, it's a kind of resistance that from afar looks like there is none and it's silent, but it is does exist. Through music, through poetry, I'm part of a, quite a few um, online poetry groups. Um, and the women are really expressing themselves. Because we only have 15 minutes left, let's just try to get as many questions as possible. There's a mic going around and it, I see four and then so maybe all four people can ask their questions. So they're Thank you. Thank you very much for fascinating talks. Um, I wanted to ask if both of you could say something about um, the women's movements in the early 20th century and what the women tended to base their claims for rights on. You know, did they draw at all on you know, Western writers and thoughts? Did they talk about maternalism or you know, what was it, or, or did they just ask for rights you know what was the you know, was there something from their you know their own cultures that they put forward as the justification early 20th correct um in iran you see actually see a wide variety uh it was a very diverse society uh many ethnic groups many different kinds of um i mean there's it's majority shia is islamic but there are other religious minorities tribal groups city folk 
Uh, and so uh, women from the tribal groups, for instance, had historically been more independent and, you know, they rode horses and shot guns and um, some of these women armed themselves to fight for the revolution. Uh, and then you have other women who were, who were literate, who were educated, um, either in schools run by Western missionaries, um, including American missionaries or private tutors. And some of them are using language that's very similar to what you see happening in the West at the time. Um, but a lot of these women, especially the, the women who weren't educated, um, who are out there marching in the streets, it's they're, they're talking about the rights of their country to be independent. And then they're saying, and we're citizens of this country and we can't go to school and we can't vote for this new parliament. And so we need rights too. And so it's a lot of it is this um, coming to that realization on their own, like women do in other contexts. Um, going forward, 1910s, 1920s, there's a variety. So some women, frame their call for rights within an Islamic context, um, looking at Islamic texts and saying, you know, women in Islam historically were allowed to be educated. There were these prominent female figures in Islam, um, including the, the prophet's uh, first wife. And, um, you know, so they, they draw on these examples to make a, a religiously oriented claim. But then there are others who really ground their arguments in secular um, concepts, uh, especially in the in the 20s um, and these women that were pictured in the uh, so patriotic association. Um, they're more secular oriented and, and more Western oriented, but they're also drawing on concepts that women in Egypt and, and Turkey were, were using at the time, too. So there's this sort of global conversation that they participate in and you see shared ideas and shared language. Um, as far as Afghanistan, early 20th century, you're really looking at Queen Soraya's period, um, and she leads that first feminist movement. Um, and she's influenced because, you know, her mother was Syrian, I believe, um, and came and born and grew up in the Ottoman Empire. Um, and she was influenced by women and feminists in different places, Soraya, and, uh, you know, Alda Idib, who's a um, Turkish feminist um, of that period, influenced. Uh, it's it's possible that influenced her, uh, influenced her father. Her father may have. Father was a very well known um, journalist and poet. Their paths may have crossed. She might have come across. So she's influenced on a global level um, in bringing in those feminisms into Afghanistan and trying to contextualize them in that in that space. But for the most part, there's a huge divide between the middle class, uh, privileged women, elite women, and then the rural. Is there, uh, among young people in Afghanistan, anything like the widespread disillusion with religion that we see in Iran? We maybe just have everyone ask their question and then they'll respond. Yes, uh, Halime. Um, I was wondering if you could suggest some reasons why when the U.S. put so much funding and effort into the gender program, what might be some of the reasons it was such a terrible failure for Afghanistan? I think that this is some. This is a whole chapter in my research. Um, that's still something we're all synthesizing because it's still so new and recent. Doing the research, um, a lot of, a lot of programming that went into bringing women into certain kinds of positions that the culture wasn't ready to accept. So I give the example of gender mainstreaming, which was an, a motivation through um, uh, women's rights activism that came from the outside. And that meant going into governmental institutions, setting up a gender mainstreaming program or a shop or an office and start placing women inside institutional structures that they had never been in. And the culture wasn't, had not caught up yet. So by the time we reached 2021, they were starting to, they needed a long, longer period. They, need, they needed decades for that culture to start weaving into those institutional cultures and then layered with the variation of Avon cultures that were represented within these institutions they weren't going to hold long enough. They, they weren't holding long enough. And the project of the Republic, as we say, the 20 years needed a lot more, needed 60 years 
to actually ingrain into that culture. That's probably one small example of many, many more that we're people who are studying the period of the Republic and gender are starting to look at. Oh, as far as widespread disillusionment in young people in religion, I don't think we see that as much in Afghanistan, um, but definitely in the kinds of interpretations that the Taliban have pointed out to. I think we see a lot more uh, resistance to that this time around than we did the previous regime from 96 to 2001, um, because more people have been educated and trained in, and seen the development in different Islamic countries. Um, so I think it's the interpretation, not necessarily Islam itself. Can I just thank you both for your excellent presentations? I thought they were just outstanding. Um, thinking about perhaps less Afghanistan than Iran, um, after the Green Revolution of 2009, 2008, 9 where there was a sense that the United States and the West more generally didn't help women at that time. Um, is, there, is there anything that the United States can do to help foment reform in Iran in particular? It might be a bit early, as you're saying, for Afghanistan, but um, in Iran. And what would you suggest that some United States administration do to help them? Yeah, you mentioned it actually, Elizabeth, that there are sixty or seventy percent. There are sixty or seventy percent of the students um, in the Iranian universities are female, and there are actually more PhD students, female PhD students, than male PhD students. This is not the way that it was during the Shah's regime. Actually, the number of the students were probably maybe three, four percent of the university students. So, so, I mean, this, this deserves a little bit of attention and analysis that how this happened. If we have such an uh, Islamic revolution or Islamic government that represses the women, but at the same time we see this, which contradicts. To answer your question, sir, my cousin visited Iran last year. He lives in Canada. Europeans are selling mass weapons to Iran to make money. The West has no interest changing the regime. Iranians have to do it. I'll ask, we had some good questions online, um, but one is, um, I know Kelly, you spoke to the role of the diaspora, and since we have many from uh, both Afghan and Iranian diaspora in the room, um, how do, has the diaspora helped strengthen the feminist movement within both Iran and Afghanistan? Speaking to that. It's a lot to cover. Um, Alexander, your question is like a whole book. <laughs> uh, I will say, I, I don't think that any administration, regardless of party, should be talking about going in and, and enacting regime change, uh, to, to agree with your point. Uh, the US is very bad at that. And any new government post-Islamic Republic will have to come from internal, inside Iran in order to be legitimate. Um, but there are things that could be done to help the Iranian people. Um, just, just a few, uh, you know, actually paying attention, keeping an, uh, you know, keeping a, a, a sharp eye on what's happening in, in Iran, and continually talking about the human rights abuses. Um, it creating pathways for resources to get to anti-regime dissidents because sanctions, it's very difficult to get them resources. But something like a strike fund would help tremendously for Iranians planning further action against the regime. Um, you know, internet access that can't be tracked by the regime, and people are using Starlink, but that is not secure. Um, there, there are you know other ways. I, I'm not going to get deep into it because some of it is is uh, there are confidential co uh, conversations happening in DC. I'll say based on how best to help the Iranian people topple the regime themselves. But I do think that the regime is vulnerable. Um, it's never been less popular at home, despite how uh, increasingly confident it's acting abroad. Um, regarding women in, in the uh, universities, you're right. I mean, that there was that women were just starting to really go to the university um, before 79 and in noticeable numbers. Uh, post 79, the regime, 
they barred women from studying certain subjects and they separated men and women in universities, but they did not ban women from going to school the way the Taliban did. And so I think increasingly Iranian women recognize the power of education and they seize that opportunity themselves and they recognize that they get that degree um, that gives them opportunities that not having a degree would. Uh, and actually you see women are the majority of STEM students in Iran, for instance. Uh, and so this, I think is really, you know, Iranian women are leading this. It's not the regime saying, yes, go get your PhD. This is wonderful. Um, and in fact, there've been some conversations in the regime about maybe further limiting what women can study because they are concerned about how women are starting to dominate higher education. Um, but I'll say that's also a phenomenon here where women are now more the, the majority of, of university students in the US. Um, role of the diaspora. Uh, I'll, I'll let Halima take that, and then maybe if there's a minute, I can come back to it. I think that the diaspora, there's a lot that, there's a lot of good that diaspora can do, and I think it varies between countries, but with the Afghan diaspora, there's a lot of good, there's also a lot of harm that diasporas can do, especially when conditions are difficult inside the country. Um, there's a, so, but the, the good that they can do is mobilize initiatives um, such as um, supporting human rights defenders. Um, so in Afghanistan with the feminists and the protests, um, and many women left, they had to leave when they were women's rights. They were uh, very recognized women's rights defenders during the Republic, very much afraid that the Taliban would sweep through and pick them up right away. So I understand their concerns, but now there's this new front line that's emerged. And every six months to a year when there's a protest or there's activity, that front line, either get scared off or because they get calls at home, they get death threats, they get imprisoned. So then a new front line emerges. So what things that are important are um, human, uh, funds for human rights defenders to be able to extract them, to send them to a regional country for a while, lay low, and they can either return or stay abroad. But it's continuously, it's almost like funding an army. It's constantly funding the next front line, the next front line. That's what sometimes resistance looks like. And I hate to give a militarized kind of example, but that's sometimes what it looks like. And that's what I see Afghanistan looking like. These women putting their bodies on the line in, in soft resistance and hard resistance and coming to the front lines. I'm getting killed, some getting uh, imprisoned, um, some getting shut down, and then the next line comes. And we hope to just keep pushing those lines forward. I think the situation is somewhat similar in Iran too. Um, people keep saying, where's their Nelson Mandela with this protest movement? And I said, well, there are hundreds, they're just in prison or they've been executed. Um, and the diaspora is critical in, you know, they, they, they are able to support the, the, the movement inside the country through resources. Um, they have ties to the country. Uh, they can bring the voices of people in Iran to, broader audiences in the West, uh, they can keep pressure on policymakers, but the problem has been a lack of unity in the diaspora community. Um, there was this, this beautiful moment in early 2023 where all of the different main diaspora leaders came together and created a solidarity council and were saying, we're here to represent the voice of the Iranian people. And I thought, okay, this is it. This is where we're finally gonna get some movement. And it collapsed very, you know, within a month or two, um, because of disagreements between the diasporic leaders, there's just so much factionalization. And what I'm hearing in Washington is, well, which diasporic leader do we listen to? Why should we bother to listen to the Iranian American community if they can't get themselves together and speak in one voice? Uh, and so I think they could have much more power, um, but it, it involves working out internal disagreements for the, the you know, betterment of the people still in the country. Um, but I mean, Iranians, I, I will say, especially Iranian women have been majorly influential globally in the human rights movement um, in, in getting progress, especially in the 90s at the UN on women's rights, on human rights, um, it, you know, talking about all kinds of issues that affect women everywhere. And I think Iranian women, you know, there's a good side and a bad side, but diasporas are complicated. And I'm so sorry, but we must end. But clearly, we need to offer programming like this again. Mm -hmm. And so, Halima <laughs> and Kelly Shannon, I hope this is not the last time we'll see you here. And you can come up and ask your questions. But if we can please thank them for these really rich presentations. <laughs>